Hello, everyone. Welcome back to today's podcast. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's podcast, we're going to talk about being married for a year. We have officially accomplished 12 months of marriage with no hiccups. So I want to talk about that. Before we get into the podcast, I normally have a drink with me, but today I'm not risking this dress getting spilled on girls. So we're not doing that. And my breathing is a little labored today. My allergies are not my friend today. I've taken my pill, but Indiana Jones loves this spot on my bed. And so I'm just breathing in her little hair particles. So forgive me for my labored breathing. With that said, if you guys are interested in the dress that I'm wearing, I actually got it from one of my favorite designers. I'm sure you've seen her Instagram. Her name, I'm going to butcher it, is Tiota. Mm, Matoshi. She's fabulous. She's wonderful. She's beautiful. She's just everything you could ever want in a designer. And this dress is any, just everything I could have wanted in a wedding dress. So please check her out, links down below. Now, the way that I wanna do this podcast is obviously reflect on my marriage, but also just like relationships in general. What's it like being in a healthy marriage? What's it like, what is it like having a successful first year of marriage with no hiccups? And more than that, I actually asked you guys on YouTube and on Discord for questions you might've had about that first year of marriage in general, and also specifically about my marriage. So what I did is I took those questions since, since some of you had like similar questions and I put them together in a, like a little spreadsheet and I'm kind of kind of going to go off that to answer my the questions to the best of my ability. Now, the thing that I want to focus on to begin with is sort of the basics. You know, I'm 35, I'm queer, I'm a YouTuber, I'm a content creator. I work for myself, I'm an American, I moved to Croatia, my partner's Croatian. You know, this process has been smooth sailing in terms of the relationship. And of course, life itself has been difficult. Things like immigration, things like moving country, dealing with just my job stuff, like that stuff, that stuff gets to be a lot. But the good news is after being married for a year, the relationship itself has had zero hiccups. So we're going to start off with sort of the basics in case you're new to my channel, but also to refresh everybody else. <sighs> Great question. I always get on this channel. Is it a husband or a wife? He's a husband who's a wife, so all pronouns are welcomed. Okay, we're gonna start there. So I might switch out of pronouns during this conversation. All pronouns are good pronouns, right? I wanna start off with the idea that one of you brought up to me, which is like, what is love when it comes to being partnered? I'm gonna use the word companionship, and I think that means so many different things to different people, but I believe in love. So that's first and foremost. You know, I've had toxic relationships in my 20s. I've struggled to find myself. I've been to therapy. My partner and I are big proponents of therapy, getting better introspection. We believe in, you know, having a good relationship with yourself. And both of us in our single lives were able to accomplish a good relationship with ourselves. So when we met each other, we were older. We had established ourselves. We knew our values. And we were able to make companionship work because being together felt so natural, I think because we had such good relationships with ourselves individually. So when I think about love and companionship, I think about its complementary nature. I think about moving in symbiosis in a positive way. I think about the fact that I have nothing to complain about because we picked each other, not because we were desperate and lonely, but because we were already so happy to have somebody we could share that happiness with just felt so natural and true and right. So one of the questions that I always get about that first year of marriage is sort of, is the honeymoon period over? And I talked to my partner about this and we came to the conclusion that we might have actually expedited that process. Usually when typical couples, I'll use typical, there's 8 billion people on the planet and lots of bubbles, but we're from the bubble that is used to hearing people say the honeymoon phase is over because they base the honeymoon phase off of high chemistry, uh, sort of like the fantasy of that partner, the potential of that partner. Because we did a courting style marriage, it meant for the first six months during the engagement period, we were courting, we were seeing, we were sharing all of our insecurities. We were, you know, going over any possible miscommunication styles, you know, different family values, customs. I'm an American. He's Croatian. Is that going to be a problem? What if our families don't like each other? What if this, you know, we talked about all types of things, kids, finances, any sort of illnesses, right? You guys know I have fibromyalgia. We have things we have to deal with as a married couple that maybe during a dating period would be easy, but during a marriage period wouldn't be. And so we had sort of had to ask ourselves, could we handle that being married? Could we be companions? So the honeymoon phase for us 
maybe if we're going to call it that, sort of that initial DM slide, that initial, hey, I think I might be interested in this person. But I think we squashed the possibility of living for potential or fantasy very quickly because I was also at a stage where I'm like, hey, I'm only dating to get married. I'm not really interested in dating anybody or having anyone tied to me that isn't looking for marriage. Now, marriage for the sake of this conversation is long-term companionship, meaning till death do us part in sickness and in health including illnesses like Alzheimer's or God forbid, you know, some sort of a car accident that leaves us in a coma. We're really talking about a very serious commitment here. And whether you call it marriage or long-term companionship or whatever you want to use as your words, the words mean something to us. We're not looking for until we get bored. We're not looking for, hey, we'll just get divorced if we're over it. We're not looking for something casual. We were looking for something real. But what does real mean in a world that's having a loneliness epidemic? Real is about loving the consciousness, that person, that specific human. And then that specific human in you, with that love, choose to also be companions, which is a very specific commitment. We're not going in and out. We're not having doubts. We're not questioning. We allowed every doubt, every question we had to happen during that courting process. So that first year of marriage was so smooth and so perfect because it didn't have any place for doubt. It didn't have any place for negative feelings. All fear was allowed to be discussed and just expressed without reserve during the courting process. Now, of course, we still can do anything unreserved through the marriage process. But the reason I think our first year of marriage was so good and it continues to be so good is just because one, we're allowed to communicate all of our fears without judgment. Two, we have such good faith for one another. Like so much good faith, the bait bros would cry if they saw it. Like so much good faith. And we also don't lie to each other. How many couples do you know who lie to each other? How many bubbles do you know who tell you that if you're dating, you should put your best foot forward, almost lie about who you're gonna be? And then when you get married, it all falls apart. So that honeymoon stage that people say ends after the first year of marriage, I think ends because you're sort of lying about who you are and you're false promising to your your partner. You're over promising, you know, what kind of a marriage, what marriage is going to look like because I'm, I'm putting my best foot forward during dating. Well, for him and I, I think what we did is we expressed all of our insecurities, all of our honestly, our vices, things that we were bad at, our weaknesses. And I said, hey, here are the things that I'm working on that I'm, here are my weaknesses. What do you think? And so we balanced our weaknesses and our strengths to be cohesive. And I think that's not taught in a lot of cultures. I think a lot of people are sort of told to lie to their partners about financial situations or infidelity or whatever else. I mean, how many Reddit stories do I have to hear about people that are like, oh, my partner has a vasectomy and they didn't tell me. That is a huge violation in this marriage. And that was something we made very clear during the courting process, that there was no room for you to leave things out. Oh, I'm just going to admit the fact that I have a vasectomy. Like you can't omit these things. These are very important things. And then we have to do this as a team. We don't want, we don't want our teammates going into a situation blind and we're each other's teammates. So no one's going in blind. Okay. Now, When it comes to the honeymoon stage, there is a fantasy that's wrapped into the honeymoon stage that also coincides with a back and forth between single life and married life because married life is an insinuation of the ending of the honeymoon period. And I think married life should be even better every year, every day, every hour, every minute. So for us going into marriage, we're very much like forever and always. Like we are each other's best friends. Like we love each other so much. Like we are each other's like favorite person ever, right? Within reason in a healthy way. I think a lot of people are so toxic that when they hear like, oh, he's my best friend. They're like, what what about your actual best friend? Look, I come from a bubble where you call your spouse, your best friend. My parents call each other their best friends because they're the person you confide a hundred percent into. I don't confide a hundred percent into my best friends. I never have. I never will. And they don't confide a hundred percent into me. It doesn't make any sense. We're not doing life together. So the person I'm doing life with, that is my best friend. Now I should hope, and maybe this is just my bubble, that your partner should be above your family and friends, but not at the expense of your family and friends. Like, obviously I prioritize myself, my partner, my marriage, my family. This is my family. And then, but not at the expense of, I consider my family and friends and job and all those other things, right? Like there's just, 
sort of this conversation I think that happens around really toxic people where they think, you know, they're thinking of a toxic situation where a man is like, oh, you don't, you don't have a best friend. I'm your best friend. And then he sort of alienates you from your girlfriends and from the people that could tell you if you're in an abusive relationship. Okay. That's different. That's toxic. That's unhealthy. When you're in a healthy relationship and you say, that's my best friend, it's not because they're alienating you. It's because you're feeling so seen and deeply understood and you still have friends and family. I talk to my besties all the time. I talk to my family all the time. We're always Marco polling. We're always like just texting pictures and memes. I'm not being, you know, kept away from people, even though I live in Croatia and I basically don't see anyone but him. I'm not being isolated. I'm freer than I've ever been before because I'm doing exactly what I want to do every day. And we'll talk about that. What is it like actually doing everything I want to do every day? It is the best feeling in the world. And the fact that I get to do it with a partner, that's, I can't even explain how good that is. Now, that brings me to, uh, do I miss being single? That's a question I get. And I've realized two types of people ask this question for the sake of this conversation. Do you miss being single? Could mean, do you miss being with other people? Like, do you miss being like on Tinder? No. And that's not even what I'm thinking about. I'm not in this group of people. I'm in another group of people. Talk about categorization. When I say, when I used to say, when I was in my 20s and I used to be in relationships and I would say, man, I kind of miss being single. I didn't want to sleep with other people. I just wanted to be at home doing my own crafts and watching my anime and minding my business. Anytime I was in a toxic relationship in my 20s and I was like, I miss being single, it had nothing to do with being with other people. It had to do with being with myself. I just wanted to be alone. So when I say I'm alone in this marriage in the best way possible, it means I feel like I'm able to do those craft projects. I'm able to work. I'm able to do exactly what I want every day. And I get a wife and I get my partner and I get the love of my life. I get the best of both worlds. I don't want to sleep with other people. I don't like people like that. I don't like anybody. Moving into my 30s, I'm in my peace era, girl. I don't like you that much. You're not that funny, okay? I already found my best friend. For me, the feeling of being single is about me doing exactly what I want every day. Sitting on my kitchen counter and eating my, you know, my food, playing music loudly, singing in the shower, walking around the house naked, you know, sleeping whenever I want, working whenever I want. Like <laughs> that's what I think the best parts of being single is, is you could just live your life how you want without needing to think about other people. Now, obviously my partner and I think about each other. Example, we check in every day and every night about our schedule. So good morning. How are you? I love you. Kiss, kiss, kiss. So one of us usually wakes up before the other, depends on the day. Like today I woke up before him. Sometimes he wakes up before me. Kind of usually he wakes up before me. And then we kind of, you know, greet each other. How are you? We're both neurodivergent. We both take two to three hours to wake up and be a person, right? So like, I love you. How are you? How's your morning caffeine? What do you have planned today? How can I help you today? Do you need anything from me today? We're always checking in because we love each other so much. We just want to do the best for each other, right? I think in a lot of relationships, people will feel like burdened, like, oh, I don't want to have to check in with somebody. That's not your person. This is my person. I want to check in with them. I want to be like, girl, what do you need from me today, girl? I'll do it. What do you need? And then we make the day go the way we want it to go. Even at nighttime, like the other day, I couldn't sleep and they had already fallen asleep. And I was like, I just can't sleep, bro. So I got up, Chloe Bailey in my ear, my earphones, girl gone on my computer and edited a video. And that freedom is so beautiful. I've heard from so many couples that are like, oh, like once my partner's asleep, like I'm not allowed to get out of bed or they'll get upset. And yes, I understand like I sleep better when he's in bed with me and it kind of sucks when he stays up later and I go to sleep alone. But at the end of the day, the last thing I'm gonna do is tell him not to go do his business because I need someone to go to sleep with. Like, does he come cuddle me before so I can fall asleep in his arms? Yes, girl. But at the same time, I want him to live his life feeling free. If he wants to get up in the middle of the night and go play video games, beautiful. If I want to get up in the middle of the night and edit a video, beautiful. We want to encourage each other to feel free in this marriage, not to sleep with other people. Okay? Because we're monogamous. But to actually live the life they want to live every day. Now, in my marriage, of course, since both of us are monogamous, that's what we negotiated. It's what we desire. It's very easy for us to have hobbies. We love our hobbies. We spend all of our time doing those things. If we're not with each other, we each have our own offices. This is mine. 
he is his next door. And we love it. He's doing it right now. He's doing his stuff. I'm doing my stuff. Like as we speak, I can kind of hear his voice a little bit. I don't think you all can hear it. I can hear the like the vibrations. And I'm like, oh, there he is doing his thing. And I'm doing my thing. And that feels so freeing. Today I woke up and I was like, hey, babe, I did a photo shoot today. I'm going to do my podcast. I have a call today. Oh, and I have an event on the Discord. My day is packed. And he's like, great. I love you. Have a great day. And I'm like, I love you. Thank you so much. I've got soup, got broth and rice and stuff going on the stove. You know, he's going to do his thing today. He's got his list of things to do on a Sunday. You know what I'm saying? Like we are having, we are living the life we want to live. If we were single, this is the life we'd be living. It's just, we both have partners. When he was single and he was in his own apartment and he was working and gaming full time and doing his own thing and eating on his own and seeing his friends, like, cool. So we do that, but now we're together. And yes, there are things that we both did single that we don't do married. Actually, during the courting process, and I know a lot of you guys are always asking about like, what do you do with miscommunication? What do you do when you have conversations that aren't going well? We tried our best during the courting process. It was a six month process in total to really share all of those insecurities, to really say to one another, what are some things in this marriage that could blow it up? What are the bad things that we're afraid of that could ruin the relationship? So we talked about those weaknesses. There were things that we both did in our single lives that we didn't want to bring into our marriage. And so we negotiated those things, cut them off and ended up becoming, well, I think we ended up becoming stronger and better people, but different married than we could have been single. So we became different people. But I mean, how could you not once you're married? There's something about it. It's like once you become a mother or a father, it's like once you become that once you become a person who's in your career, things change, you change. So we changed to become people that could be the healthiest, strongest marriage. We prioritized our marriage over our single life because us single is great, but there were things we did when we were single that just don't make sense being married. You know, even habits like, oh my gosh, uh, think about like laundry habits or something really innocent, like how often you do the dishes or, you know, oh, maybe you're like uh, really um, like piles of clothes everywhere. Like we took all of those habits we had as single people. Like I used to keep clean clothes in a pile on my floor in my bedroom. I don't do that anymore. We don't do that anymore. We put our clothes away. We organize the house. Even my sister the other day, she was like, girl, every time I see your house, it's so clean. And I'm like, married life. Married life made us cleaner people. Married life makes us better. We work very hard to keep the house clean for one another. And it really makes a big difference in my marriage. Now, to be fair, I got this from my parents. My parents were examples, you know, very married, long time, lots of kids, very happy, best friends. They keep the house very organized for one another. They enjoy spending their weekends. You know how, okay, let me tell you, you know how they have couples where the guy's like, I worked all week. I don't want to have to do a list of chores that my wife gave me on the weekends. That's not how my parents are. My parents are like, okay, we worked all week. What are our chores for the weekends? Now it might be an immigrant thing. It might be an Assyrian thing, but I think this is pretty common in a lot of couples. Like my parents like their weekends because it is their opportunity to work on the house put in their fruit trees. My dad like has his little projects. He's, you know, he's got a lot of hobbies. The weekend is not the time. Like their idea of relaxing is spending time building this house they love. You know how often I talk about sacrifice, how I don't feel like I sacrificed anything being in this marriage because it was what I wanted. If it's something I want, there's no sacrifice. There's only reaching goals. I think my parents are like that. They might say they sacrificed some things to have children, but the truth is they wanted children more than they wanted their single life or non-child life. If you have to change your lifestyle to be better parents, then that's just you aiming for a goal that you wanted anyways. If you resent your child or you resent your change, if getting married made your life worse, then why did you do it? I wouldn't have gotten married and chosen this human if it didn't make my life better. And it makes just so much sense to me to do something that makes your life better. To be fair though, in my 20s, I convinced myself that maybe a good relationship was also one that had fights or that was bad, or that made me get the ick sometimes, or made me feel like I was taking being taken advantage of. Maybe that's what love was. Even though that's what not what was modeled to me, maybe it's what I thought 
was true because of romance movies and video games and things that I saw video games. I don't know why I said that girl and play no video games, whether it's an anime or a movie or a book. Sometimes those toxic relationships look like what real love is, but I think real love is peace. Real love is calm. Real love is companionship. That's safe. I feel so safe in this relationship. I have never trusted somebody so much in my life to have the best of intentions for me based off of my needs, not their thoughts of what I need. So many relationships have the best intentions for their partners based off of what they think they need. He asks me, what do you need? And I tell him and we do it. And I ask him, what do you need? And he tells me and I do it. I don't tell him, actually, I think I know you better than you know yourself. And I think you need, no, we are very introspective people. I trust him to know what he needs. He trusts me to know what I need. And it's worked out fabulous for us. Now, to be fair again, we really did the work on ourselves before we got married. So based off the questions you guys gave me, one of the more common questions that I think kind of relates to that idea of knowing yourself is also the transition period between being a single person and being in a couple and being on your own and being in a shared space. There are so many things that come into play there. Our neurodivergencies, our weird habits, something that came up recently that I think is kind of funny is I was telling my mom that we eat different things when we eat because we're both very, you know, same meal every day for a few months and then we drop it and eat something else. And sometimes like I'm eating this meal and he's eating this meal and I'm not going to force him to eat something he doesn't want to eat again. I want you to do exactly what you want to do every day. If I want to eat this, but you want to eat this, you eat your pasta and I'll eat my pizza. If I want to eat chicken nuggets and you want to eat mac and cheese, like great. But my mom, you know, was trying to give us some marriage advice, which I think is really valid. I think she has a really good point where what you want to do is eat together. And I agree with her. I think she wanted me to take a step further and eat the same meal. But I think what's really important is that we're eating together. Eating together is some of our most intimate moments. Because it is like we're tasting things. We're like talking to each other about flavors. We're like, ooh, we're sharing, we're talking. It's a really great moment. So for us, we eat a lot together. We cook together. We judge each other's meal choices together. It's like really fun. I'm like, let me taste your sandwich. And he's like, let me taste your thing. And we're like, mm, I see why you like it, but mm, and like, we'll talk about, like it adds so much opportunity for conversation. And then if we're going to watch something while we eat, and this is very important, we pause and we discuss. It's just a part of our personality type, which is actually very similar to how my siblings and I are. We pause and discuss. So you're never going to watch a TV show with Brittany and like actually get through the whole episode without a pause. We pause, discuss for 30 minutes. Like it's just how it goes. Anime, movies, TV shows, we're pausing, discussing, pausing, discussing. So when we're having dinner together and we're pausing and discussing, Again, we're eating together. We're focused on each other. We're not distracted by the TV. We're not Matilda's family. Remember Matilda growing up the show, the movie? We're not Matilda's family that's like so glued to the TV. We're not actually being intimate or spending time together or getting to know one another. So this transition period from being with my siblings or being on my own to being in a home with him and his transition from being in his bubble to my bubble, like when we came together to make this bubble together, we already had so many complimentary uh, habits that really worked together. I'm so glad he's a talker. Oh my God, this man could talk. All day, this man could talk. And I'm like, uh-huh. And we saying, we could talk all day. We never shut up. But when we need to, we're able to say something like, do you mind if I have my alone time right now? I'm a little overstimulated. I'm so sorry. I love you. I'm having a really hard time paying attention to what you're saying. I think I need a break. I'm on low spoons. And that is something we can do without punishment. When he comes to me and says, I'm so sorry, I love you, but like, can I go play video games? Babe, I love you. Have fun, baby. Turn up, girl, no judgment, you know? Same when I'm like, I love you so much. I just, I need to work on this thing and I can't be interrupted. He's just like, okay, I love you. And I'm like, I love you. And then we say, I love you so much throughout the day, girls. Oh my gosh, the way we say I love you all the time. And you know what? It's very similar to how I, how I grew up. Every time I hang up the phone with family, every time I hang up the phone with my siblings, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. We're very affectionate. We want to reinforce in those people, we love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And we get to do that with another. And we do it, or with one another, and we do it a lot. Hey, I love you, 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 I love you. And it's the greatest feeling. And some people will say, oh, that's the honeymoon period. Except I witnessed my family doing it for decades. 
we're just one of those families. Not every family is the same. Some families never hug their parents. My parents are very affectionate. Hug, 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 kiss, 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 kiss. Arabs are like, at least my part of the Middle Eastern kind of bubble, very affectionate. So I grew up with very affectionate parents. I grew up with a lot of like, I love you, squeezing, hugging, very, you know, so it makes sense that I ended up marrying somebody who I could also do that with. It makes sense that we have that in our marriage. Remember, I'm really lucky. I grew up with parents who loved each other. I'm really lucky that I grew up with parents who showed a lot of affection, who, who were very nice to each other. And when they had disagreements, though it got heated, they never took it out on one another. So one of the things you guys talked about or asked me about was sort of miscommunications or like fighting. I'm gonna put fighting in quotation marks here, girls. We do not fight. Him and I do not fight. Okay, we are out here pulling each other's hair, calling each other names. Like we have so much good faith with one another that if there's a miscommunication, we go, hey, I think we're miscommunicating. I think my feelings are a little hurt, like 5%. Can we talk about it? And then we go, yeah, let's talk about it. We also have safe words we put in place like yellow. I'm sorry. I think that tone really hurt my feelings and I'm not sure if I'm maybe being like if I'm blowing it up or if it's accurate. And then we really give each other an opportunity to have our feelings hurt. If your feelings are hurt, I am sorry. That was not my intention. And you are valid for feeling that way. Let's fix it. We also do not take advantage of each other. We do not lie to one another. So if I pretend my feelings are hurt and I'm like, don't hurt my feelings. And he's like, but did it? And I'm like, no, I would never make him feel like he hurt my feelings if he didn't. I do not lie for attention. He does not lie for attention. We do not deceive one another. If we're playing it up, like I'm a very like a jokester. So like sometimes like, you know, he'll squeeze me and I'm like, ow. And he's like, did that really hurt? And I'm like, yes, my bones are broken. And then he'll say yellow. Did it actually hurt? And I'm like, no, I'm fine. He's like, okay. Because he doesn't actually want to hurt me. I don't actually want to hurt him. How many couples do you know who actually try to hurt one another? passive aggressiveness, lying. You know, you can take something really traditional and very boomer, like he wants to have sex and she doesn't want to. And it's like, hey, babe, are you in the mood? It's like, no, I have a headache, but she doesn't have a headache. She just doesn't want to do it. If we have a situation like that occur, we don't pretend we have a headache. We just like, nah, I'm not in the mood, bro. Sorry. And then we just go, okay, cool. It's like, we don't give each other an opportunity to lie because the truth is never offensive to us. <sighs> Game changer. Game changer. When I dated in my 20s, it was like every time my partner would say something, I'd be like, are they lying to me? Because they would lie. Now, to be fair, we grew up in a world that teaches you to lie. Lie, 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 lie. And what we're doing in our relationship might be radical, but we are practicing radical honesty. And it is, it can be like, whoa, I was not prepared to hear that. Something as simple as, oh my God, the other day, I'm reaching in for a kiss and it's like, oh, your breath is stale. And I'm like, nobody wants to hear their breath is stale. Nobody wants to hear that. But I go, okay, my bad. Let me go brush my teeth. Cause like it has been a while since I've eaten anything for sure. Let me go brush my teeth. Let me go do this. I would rather him tell me my breath is stale than for him to kiss me and like pretend it isn't. But we're told, no, you smell good. You look good. Like, no, girl, go take a shower, girl. I can smell you. I know you worked out today, girl. I know you worked out today, girl. You know, like, go take a shower, girl. We give up our, we, uh, we give a space. We, we allow ourselves a space to tell the truth. And then we allow our space to feel bad about it or to even say, I feel bad about this, but I'll get over it. I shouldn't feel bad about this because we're human and we're going to hurt each other's feelings, but never on purpose. Never on purpose never passive aggressive, never on purpose. And this is the key for me that was the game changer. I'm actually married to somebody who's not gonna be passive aggressive, who isn't gonna lie to me, who will say out loud the thing that even if it hurts my feelings, they want me to know, but they'll say it in a way that is truly loving in good faith. We're not trying to hurt each other's feelings, but sometimes it might happen. But the fact that we want to love each other and we want to treat each other with the the, so much kindness means that let's say one of us is giving into our vices. We won't say, oh, that's just like they're going through it and like you're doing great, baby. We'll say, hey, I love you, but you're really like giving into your vice too much today and you got to be more disciplined. Let's go. You know, we're each other's like favorite buddy at the gym and each other's greatest cheerleader. 
We don't want to lie to each other. We don't want to, you know, we don't like if we're working on something and I'm not meeting my quota, he doesn't sit there and go, yes, you're doing it. He goes, you're doing a great job, but you're kind of fucking up here. And I'm like, fuck, you're right. Okay. I'll do more pushups. I'll work out more. Like, especially with my fibromyalgia, a lot of the time, if I, let's say I have a day where I'm like, I don't want to work out. He's like, Hey, if you don't work out, you're going to bitch again tomorrow. And like, you need to work out. And so like, it's nice to have somebody who's like, work out. I So I love you. You're doing a great job. Instead of, you don't have to work out today. You, you're okay. You can take a break off. If he encouraged me to give into my vices, he would be a bad partner. And I think a lot of partners out here encourage each other to give into their vices so they also can give into theirs. Not good girls. Okay. Let's look through these questions you guys gave me. Um, Okay. One of the things you guys asked about is the differences between being a team and an individual. So we're individuals on a team. He's his own person. I'm my own person. And together we make the greatest lesbian couple who's ever existed. Like together we get me, we make the greatest team, but we are still individuals on a team. But again, we prioritize our marriage, not over ourselves. And we prioritize ourselves, but not over our marriage. They have to work together. What's good for me is good for the marriage. What's good for the marriage is good for me. And that's how we do it. Personally, in our marriage, it seems to be the best. And it's going really well for us. We're very good at respecting each other's individuality while respecting the things we have to get done as a couple. And it's just smooth sailing, good communication, good comprehension. Ooh, one of the questions I get asked is, um, does him being Croatian cause any miscommunications because of language? No, but that's because we're very good at comprehending one another. Like, you know, communication is key, but comprehension is that other half of it. We comprehend each other. And even when we don't, we're like, can you explain that to me? That's interesting. I don't think I understand. It, it is the coolest experience that I've ever had having somebody so comprehend me. You know how you guys watch me on stream and it, everyone's like, I don't get it, Brittany, or I'll be on a panel and they're like, I don't get it. He gets it. Like 99% of the time we are on the same page, like in terms of communication, comprehension. And then when we're not, we just ask and we talk about it and we go through it. It is so beautiful. Like it is the greatest experience I've ever had in my life. And you can see me in real time struggle with other people on the internet because of my job. But when I say there is no struggle here, when I say it is the most like, oh my God, if we did podcasts together, it'd be vibes. But like many of you asked, why don't we do podcasts together? Because she doesn't want to. Just like, why don't you become a mother? I don't want to. I'm never going to force her to do something she doesn't want to do. So when people on the internet are like, why isn't she on your channel? Because she doesn't want to be. Why don't you have children? Because I don't want to. And that is the best reason. I would never force anybody in my life, but especially my partner, to do anything that was uncomfortable for them. Even if somebody was like, we'll give you a million dollars. No, not unless he wants to. Because what's most important is this marriage, their consent, and the harmony between the two of us. I would never, and I know a lot of people do this, I would never risk the sanctity of my marriage, the consent of my partner, the peace in this relationship for the sake of views. And how many couples do that and how many of them end in divorce because they didn't respect the consent of their partner? It's beautiful when I see couples on the internet do it together and it's healthy, but usually both parties are consenting. So why isn't my wife on my podcast? Because she didn't consent to be. Okay. Okay. Now, I did go over this with them though, and we had really great conversations because of the questions you guys asked us. We talked about sort of, um, you guys asked about dynamics and sickness and in health, me being the breadwinner, them having no job, that kind of stuff, no monetary job. Uh, again, we do exactly what we want to do every day. So when we got married, sort of through the courting process, we asked each other, what's your dream life look like? And my dream life was having this dream job where I worked as much as I wanted to without restriction. Their dream life was something different and I work my hardest to get them and they work their hardest to get me our dream life together. So I want this dream job. And in order to have this dream job, I need help with so many other things that I can't do myself. That's what they do, right? They want to have a life where they don't have to pursue a career. So they allow me to pursue mine. And there's something so freeing about this dynamic because in a world that judges people based off gender, age, income. We don't give a fuck what you want to judge, girl. That's between you and your God, because this relationship is too perfect for us to give a fuck what anyone else thinks about our marriage, period. 
okay? It works so well for us, you know, especially as a woman who makes money, it has always been an issue coming up, whether I was dating a woman who was very career-minded and we would never see each other or dating a man who wanted me to give up my job to have babies, it never quite worked. I always kind of had the idea that maybe I'd be in like a power couple, but then I realized like, I don't think I want a partner that works as much as I do. We would never see each other. We would just never see each other. And so I'm so grateful that I found a partner that's so comfortable, confident, and secure that they can do everything else this marriage requires to be successful. And that doesn't include bringing in a paycheck because there is so much more that goes into a marriage than bringing in money. And I really wish people would pay attention to that. And I do think the new generation is. I think Gen Z and Gen Alpha will have a very healthy and much better relationship with money and finances because I think a lot of people settle in relationships. There, Of course, there's that fear of not having monetary, um, like mo- monetary value or some sort of like paycheck coming in. Of course, if you're settling or in an abusive marriage, it's scary. But again, if you date a healthy person and you're in a healthy relationship and you know your values and you really found that relationship, the one, the one that you know is like, oh, that's it, baby, that's going to last. If you have that, then it doesn't matter if your partner works. Just like with my parents' marriage, it's so obvious to me they're never going to get divorced. Now, of course, everyone thinks that going into your marriages. The dilemma is that, and I'm going to say this with the utmost, like just the most respect, I think a lot of people settle in relationships because they're not having the hard conversations before engagement. And we had very hard conversations before engagement. There are people I know who are married 8, 10, 12 years and don't even know if their partner believes in a God. Please don't tell me you're having the hard conversations before marriage if you don't know where your spiritual, like your partner's spirituality is. This is the stuff that I'm talking about when I meet couples and I'm like, have you guys talked about kids? And they're like, no, it hasn't come up. What do you mean it hasn't come up? You bring it up. You bring it up on the first day. You bring it up on the fifth day. You bring it up. People aren't bringing it up. We brought up every single possibility, every single issue we could have. I think the world wants a relationship without the responsibility of it being in sickness and in health, without them actually being honest about the person they're choosing. And I think a lot of people settle because the world teaches you to settle. But I'm not going to settle for a house, a career, a mate, or a life that doesn't suit my joy. This is a personal philosophy. You don't have to agree. In a world where people are getting married because of monetary stuff, in a world where people are getting married to chronic cheaters, like with peace and love, we're not playing the same game. So if you want a love that is endless, if you want a love that moves you into elderly years, you've got to pick a partner that shares core values and you guys got to work together to maintain those values. It's not saying that it's going to be perfect, but we're in this through sickness and in health. Whether it's convenient or not, The only thing that matters to us is that the marriage stays healthy. Even if the rest of the world implodes, we stay healthy. Usually relationships can be impacted by the outside world. I think that's a mistake. I even think that's a mistake when you're single. I think my work is focused on giving people the tools, if you want them, to not let the world and what the world is doing impact your joy. But that's hard in a world where we're often taught that the world impacts us. It does. Of course it does. But it doesn't for a lot of the things that we let let it. A lot of people let people into their marriage. The door's closed. You can't get in. A lot of people try to control my life in different ways. Can't come in. The door's closed. And I get why they're doing it. The world, you know, the road to hell is paved in good intentions. And the world has really good intentions. I just don't think they apply to me. And I don't think my style of marriage is for everybody. It might not work for you. But for us, we want to grow old together. We, you know, we want to be here even if one of us gets Alzheimer's. We don't want to get remarried. We want to be with this person and help this person move into the next life. We also kind of not necessarily believe in an afterlife in a traditional sense, but we sort of believe in the sacredness of being there when someone dies and moving them into that path. Like they're going to die and I want to be there for them. Lots of people leave marriages once partners get sick. Lots of people remarry. Lots of people are burdened with the task of taking care of a partner in a way that feels too overwhelming or people fall out of love with a partner and then they get sick. I understand that life is complicated. I'm not trying to judge anyone's journey. I'm just trying to let you know which one I've decided to do because at some point in your life, especially if you're not married yet, you can choose. So choose wisely so you can suffer wisely because life will be suffering. He could get sick. I could die. We don't know what's going to happen. But what we do know is we're going to be here for it to the best of our ability. Okay, now, 
Um, let me make sure that I answered all these questions. Okay. Um, okay. One question that I thought was really cute is somebody asked, are you surprised by anything? Was there anything that surprised you during the first year of marriage? Now I asked them this question as well. And they said they were kind of surprised at how easy it was, though they weren't that surprised. And I feel similarly where I think we were so surprised at how easy it was, but also not that surprised. But at the same time, you just never know because we're so specific. Like we are so specific about our neurodivergency and everything, our habits, our customs that we were, you know, we were, we were sure there was going to be an adjustment period, but we adjusted very quickly. Now, to be fair, um, before we got formally, formally engaged, um, he had come to America for two weeks. I went to Croatia for one week. Then we got officially engaged. Then when I was going through my diagnosis process, he came to live with me in Arizona for a month. So he lived with me, met, you know, stayed with my brother, Mark, like we were all hanging out and we got a really good test run of living together. Then when I moved to Croatia, before we got married, we were in a one bedroom, like bachelor pad. That was his original apartment. And we did really well in that space. And it was small girl, but we did really well in that space. Then we upgraded to this now three bedroom apartment and we're doing fabulously together. Indiana loves him. I love their interactions together. He cares so deeply for her. Like you can see that he's investing. I'm investing. And we also just like each other so much. So for us, you know, we weren't that surprised it went so well, but then at the same time you're like, oh damn, okay. And our relationship was tested, not the relationship itself, but like immigration is a stressful process, paperwork, doctor's appointments, me getting all of my medical care needs, like all of that is stressful. All of those things add to the stress of a relationship. And for whatever reason, we're really good. And probably because I'm modeling my parents' relationship in a lot of ways and, and the successful relationships I've seen around me, we don't let the stresses of the world impact our love for each other. And often partners that are stressed at work take it out on their partners or partners that are stressed with the kids, they take it out on their partner. And we just want to make sure we're never, ever, ever, ever taking out our stress on each other. If I'm stressed because let's say of work, because of work or something, when I'm venting to him, I'll vent like away from him. And that way it doesn't feel like I'm throwing it all at him. I'm throwing it at the wall. Like, oh, I need to get this off my chest. Whew, okay, I feel better. But he doesn't have to carry the burden. He just like watches it pass by. He listens, but I don't want him to take on my burdens from work. He'll vent about how his day went and the things he had to get done, but he doesn't give it to me. Like he does so much of the paperwork because Croatia, I'm in Croatia. So a lot of it is like translation, translation, translation. A lot of it is like a lot of, you know, just stuff I couldn't do on my own ever, ever, ever that he handles. And that's a lot. For us, we're playing to each other's strengths and we're compensating for each other's weaknesses. And I think that is just so special, but also what I think most healthy relationships should be. And it's sad that I think it's not as common, right? I think that's what's kind of sad. Now, you guys asked about like the nuances between our job obligations, you know, chores and things like that. Look, if I'm ever too sick to do something, he compensates. If he's ever too sick, I compensate. We are there to lift each other up. We're always there to make the day better. We're thinking about each other all the time and ourselves. I make, you know, I wake up in the morning and I think, okay, he doesn't like it when I make loud noises and I'm a slammer. I slam everything, cabinets, doors. My whole family does. We're the worst. We just slam everything like boom, 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 boom. So I try to be quiet. Okay. When I'm recording videos, I don't like the laundry going. He tries to do laundry around my schedule. We do different things to make life easier for one another that if we were single or on our own, we wouldn't think about. But when we're together, we think about those things. And I think that's the biggest difference is I don't think people are thinking about each other. I don't think, I don't think other married couples are truly thinking about that person. I think they think they are. But I think they're actually thinking about themselves and how they make themselves feel better in the relationship versus making the relationship so good you both feel good about it. Does that kind of make sense? I just feel like people are missing the mark, but they think they're doing enough because they're so tired and so stressed. But you're tired and stressed because you're not, you're not actually thinking about the consciousness. So much of a stress that I see in other marriages seems to come from the fact that they don't know their partner very well. I ask them a basic question and they don't know how to answer it. Y'all are not talking enough or comprehending enough. And when you're talking, you're fighting. 
When you're talking, you're talking at each other. You're not actually sharing ideas. You're not actually excited to learn. When my partner tells me something about himself, like, oh, I prefer this glass over this glass. I'm like, oh, why? And he tells me, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. When I prefer a fork over another fork, like we talk about why that fork is better. And then when he serves me dinner, he gives me the fork I know I like, or he knows that I like. We're actually like thinking, we're not saying, oh, you need to get over that. That's so silly. How do you have a favorite fork? You're being so silly. Ugh, you don't have ADHD. You're so silly. Ugh, you don't have autism. You're so silly. Ugh, you're not this. You're so silly. We do not demean each other. We go, okay, if that's your preferred fork, I'll give you your preferred fork. We don't sit there and go, ugh, oh my God, these young people and all their labels. Ugh, we do not roll our, you know, we do not look at each other and roll our eyes at like, we go, okay, cool. Why is that? And explain, oh, and that's another thing. When we ask why, we're not fighting. We're, ex- we're like excited. This is the neurodivergency. Oh my gosh, why do you like that fork? It's not like, why do you like this fork? It's not judgmental. It's curious. It's open. It's excited. It's like, oh, why this fork and not this fork? Like we talked about mason jars for like hours the other day. Well, this mason jar is better because of this, but this mason jar feels better because of the way it grips in your hand. I was like, but this mason jar is better because of the way it feels on your lips. Like we are just talking about, imagine, imagine you're married to a talker and you're a talker and you could talk all day. That's our life. You know what I mean? Like we're not going to get sick of each other. We love talking, but also when we need a break, not because we're sick of each other, but because our spoons are running low, we give, we give each other space. You know, you can only do your favorite thing for so long before you even need a break from that. And that's kind of how we think about it. You're my favorite thing in the world, but I actually want to do something else right now. Is that okay? It's not about abandoning or rejecting. It's about fitting all of the things you want to do into your life. We're just complementary. So this first year of marriage has gone so smoothly because we feel free, safe, and we communicate and comprehend. We just like each other a lot. We don't have any doubts because we got, we made sure to cover all of those doubts during the engagement period. Like any issues we had, any miscommunications, we really talked it out and we allowed anything to be the results. So as an example, and a lot of couples, when there's a miscommunication or, or something bad that's happening, they lie to keep the relationship. We were willing to say, let's go, let's let, let's let go of the relationship if it's not going to work. So during the courting process, when we had our relationship challenged in different ways because of miscommunication and learning who the other person was, because we're strangers, we're getting to know each other. We allowed an openness for the relationship to end because again, we weren't engaged that was the point of the courting. And because we could do that so safely and because we could trust each other to tell each other the truth, it allowed us to build a foundation of honesty and transparency that made it so our communication style was clear. Because of course, at one point we were strangers and then at one point we weren't. And it really came down to how much we were talking and comprehending, not how much time we knew each other, but how much we were talking and comprehending. You can know someone for 10 years and they still might not understand you. And this comes down to seeing each other. So one of the questions you guys ask me all the time is like seeing each other, you know, communicating in a healthy way, understanding the nuances between one another. This comes down to comprehension. We've known each other a short time, but we comprehend very, very well. And this is, I think, the reason why our relationship is so good and so healthy. I've never had somebody comprehend me so well. He's never had someone comprehend him so well. And so together we have formed this very smooth relationship because it's just like communication style is so complimentary. When he says something, I know what he's saying. When I say something, he knows what I'm saying. Remember that Kiwi dilemma that came up on TikTok a few weeks ago? If he was going to Costco and I said, Kiwis are in sale, he knows what I'm saying. And he doesn't end up going on a podcast saying I'm bad at communication because I wasn't. He understood me. It doesn't matter if the world understands me. It doesn't matter if it's someone else's standard of communication. The only person I need to really understand me is him and vice versa. I don't need other people to understand our relationship or what we're doing, but I need to understand it. He needs to understand it. So if he's going to Costco and I say Kiwis are in sale, guess who's getting Kiwis later in the afternoon? You know what I'm saying? Okay. I really like this person. 
he's really great. Now, one last question, and then I'll head out. And if you guys have any more questions, you can leave them in the comment sections. and I'll cover them in future podcasts. Do I miss my family after this first year of being married? Of course. But, and to be fair, I usually only need to know one person in a place to feel secure and good. So when I lived in Seattle for five years and I didn't really see my family frequently or talk to them, I just needed one friend in the town and I was good. So normal Britney stuff is I'm pretty good anywhere as long as I know at least one person and I know at least one person here. Now I know more people because I know his family and friends, but I don't usually... If I miss my family, I go and see them. And look, if I was a millionaire, I would 100% go see my family every six months. But I'm not wealthy and we're all here middle class and average. So I will see them when the budget says I can. But we talk frequently. We're always, you know, communicating. My mom and I probably Marco Polo like every day. My sister and I are always messaging. My besties and I are always messaging. We're not always like on the phone for five hours a day. Obviously, nobody's got time for that girl. But we're always, you know, thank God we live in the internet age memeing, pictures. Most of my brothers and I stay in touch purely by memes. We almost never say anything. We just meme, 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 meme. So for us, you know, the way we're living is really good for our brains because we're just so, we're doing what we want every day. If we wanted to do something different, we would. Now, of course, within reason, like I said, I am no millionaire. And if I was a millionaire, I would be going to Cali every six months. But within a reason, we get to do what we want every day. And I'll have a podcast coming up about that soon. So if you guys want to leave any questions about that, please do. Thank you for being here. I'm very excited to have shared this with you. I'm, I feel really lucky because that's really what it was. I could have gone my whole life, my whole life without running in to a high compatibility partner. And the fact that we cross paths is something I will never take for granted I don't care how hard the world makes it, we will be together because I know how special it is in this lifetime, in any lifetime, to find a high compatibility partner. And that's what we are. We're so high compatibility, it really does feel like what the poetry is written about, what Disney movies are based off. It feels like that one in a million chance to find a soulmate, and it feels like I found mine. And it definitely, I definitely feel reassured about that every day. And yeah, I just, I can't wait to grow old with this person. Um, it's just been a really great process. Yeah. Thank you guys for asking your questions and being so respectful about boundaries. I do appreciate that. Some of you were very, very kind about it. Of course, if I missed any questions or specific topics you wanted me to cover, just let me know in the comment sections down below. Please leave a like and a subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Since 30 of you who, 30% of you who watch me aren't subscribed girl, ma'am, how am I going to get to hundred K subscribers guys? Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, 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 dun